first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to give a talk today. It's, it's just an honor to be in the 25th anniversary of JGI giving a speech. So um, the title of my presentation is Towards Leaning Consolidated Bioprocessing Bacteria or Fungi. So when I was putting the presentation together, I was thinking of telling two different stories, but then I was, um, but then when I was going through it, it's like, you know, I'm gonna focus on fungi, I'm going to focus on fungi, even though my love is, oh, my, my heart is split between the two of them. Uh, today, I'm gonna focus mostly on why rot fungi. But because I selected that title, I will still end up the presentation uh, with a couple of slides, like saying which one is better, or maybe there is none that is better. Okay. So, so I'm not gonna do like yesterday, like doing some stretches to wake up, but I think I'm gonna take you on a trip. I'm gonna take you to the Carboniferous period that happened only 360 million ago. And in that trip that I am with you, oh, microphone, uh, we are in a place, something like this. So our earth uh, was full of organic matter, lot of wood on the soil, lot of swamps, and the degradation of this organic matter was very slow. But the trip is over. And why our trip is over? So one of my favorite hypotheses about why the Carboniferous period ended is because white rot fungi appeared. And more specifically, not white rot fungi, but peroxidases. And these enzymes are involved in lignin degradation. And what is more fascinating to me is that, oh, no yet. What is even more fascinating to me is that after 360 million of years, only white rot fungi are the most efficient organisms degrading our wood in our forests. Like it's amazing that there hasn't been any other organism evolving to do this efficiently. Okay, so why rot fungi? Maybe some of you are wondering, what is that? So we call like a clade, you will see later, a group uh, of fungi, we call them white rot fungi, because after the degradation process of wood, because they remove the lignin, then the residue is enriched in cellulose. So that's why we are seeing it in a whitish color. Then just for comparison purposes, we, there is another clade of organisms called brown rot fungi. In this case, these organisms modify the lignin. So then the mycelia go to the sugars of the wood and they utilize the sugars as a carbon source. And then the residue is brown because it's enriched in lignin. But in this presentation, I'm gonna focus, uh, yes, in white rot Lignin is one of my passions and white rot are, as I was saying, the most efficient degrading this polymer. Okay, so how do white rot look like in nature? So a couple of examples. So here you can see Tramitis versicolor. This is known as the turkey tail. Uh, and this is a couple of pictures that I took three weeks ago in the rainforest in Vancouver in a different meeting. And it's just amazing to see like how all this wood on the, on the soil is just being colonized by white rot fungi all over the place. So that, that, that was paradise to me. Uh, but in the lab, like normally we don't work uh, with the fruiting bodies of these organisms. We work uh, with the mycelia that as you know, the mycelia is all over the place underneath the soil. Um, then uh, just very quickly about the uh, life cycle of white rot fungi. Uh, probably you know that they sporulate, they germinate, and then they form mycelia that can be monocarion if it only has one nucleus, or it can be dicarion after they mate. And in the lab, as you will see, sometimes we utilize monocarion or dicarion. Okay, so where are white rot fungi in the fungal tree of life? So here you have uh, the, the tree that is shown in mycocosms in the JGI website. And our white rot fungi are here in the agaricomycotina subdivision. Then more specifically, uh, our white rot fungi are in these three different classes and in these different orders. And here you have the number of species that have been reported or that are already reported in JGI. Most of the white rot fungi are in the order Agaricalas. And one example is uh, the oyster mushroom that is really good with garlic and olive oil. And then we have uh, polyporales like Tramitis versicolor, the turkey tail. 
Uh, then in terms of number of genomes, as I was saying, like right now there are no, well, not so many. There are already like 80 sequences, 80 genomes already published. But uh, in microcosms, you can find up to 150 genomes of white root fungi. Okay, so I'm not going to explain like how white how, how white rope fungi degrade lignin. Yes, very quickly. So this is the lignin polymer. As you see, it's a heter heterogeneous aromatic polymer. It's formed by three main units: is syringic, yacil, and and sinapil, depending on how many um, methoxy groups they have. But basically, what I want to show is that it's a very complex polymer. It has like many different types of bonds and many different types of units. And white of fungi have developed a system based on peroxidases and lacases that can oxidize um, like beta O4 bonds among other bonds in the lignin polymer. But even thinking of lignin degradation, that is not the panacea to degrade lignin because these enzymes, what they do is generating free radicals in the hydroxy groups. So when you have like two aromatic compounds by themselves, they are gonna repolymerize. So white of fungi do not only utilize like these uh, enzymes to break down lignin, there are metabolites and there are also many other enzymes involved in the process. Okay, so why are white of fungi important? Well, you saw in the first slide that they ended up our trip. They ended up the carboniferous period. And uh, nowadays, uh, white of fungi, uh, the, the habitat of white of fungi are forests, and forests are 30% of our planet. So as you can imagine, they are like key players in global carbon cycling. But then something that I am also interested in is in the applied science point of view. So probably you know that right now, one of the major challenges of, bio, of lignocellulosic biorefineries is that we don't know what to do with lignin. We need to valorize lignin to be able to utilize sugars very efficiently. And it's true that we are utilizing chemical catalysis tools, even we are utilizing bacteria to utilize aromatic compounds, and that's going well, but still, we are not able to have a depolymerization and utilization of the lignin together that is very efficient. So this is very futuristic, and of course, I am not solving this today, but um, uh, ideally, we can think of white of fungi as the best biocatalyst for lignin valorization. They could break down lignin, and Eventually, they could utilize the lignin, that carbon, and then secrete a product. So we could make money from lignin. That, that's our major purpose. Okay, so what do we need to know about white of fungi? Which are the gaps uh, right now? So as I was saying, uh, white of fungi are the best organisms breaking down lignin. Then they generate uh, degradation products that they can be aromatic compounds. And we also know that these organisms are able to mineralize lignin to CO2 and water. So there were uh, some beautiful studies in 1996 where they were utilizing carbon-14 labeled lignin. They were feeding that to the white of fungi, and then they were tracking that in CO2, and the CO2 was labeled in carbon-14. So it's like beautiful. They are mineralizing uh, the lignin to CO2. But uh, when I was doing my PhD a few years ago, uh, we thought, okay, that mineralization process happened extracellularly. White of fungi are breaking down lignin, they don't care about the lignin, so they have access to the sugars, and they mineralize that lignin extracellularly to CO2. But after reading some papers from the 70s and the 80s, actually they were reporting in some of these papers molecules that would correspond to intracellular metabolism, and molecules that I had already seen in bacteria. So one of the hypotheses that I had after reading those papers is like, what if we white of fungi are actually utilizing the lignin as a carbon source, and maybe the CO2 is coming from intracellular processes? So that's the main hypothesis of, of all this study, that these fungi could perhaps depolymerize uh, the lignin simultaneously to the utilization. Um, here in this slide, um, I just wanted to highlight that, okay. So the community was really interested in understanding how white of fungi degrade our lignin. So we were always studying those extracellular enzymes that are di digesting the lignin. And here you have like basically uh, looking at these proteomic studies in white of fungi, you can see that there were like up to 50 studies studying those extracellular enzymes. But the community was not interested in, in understanding what happens 
inside the fungi. So I, I think that this was like a great opportunity to say, okay, let's dig up in that intracellular metabolism. Of course, transcriptomics can give you an idea on the intracellular metabolism, but that was not the focus until, until recently. And as you can see, metabolomics, there are also like very few studies on that regard. So great opportunity. Okay, so before um, you are gonna find, like I'm gonna show you some slides where we are utilizing some aromatic compounds and some model, but not really model aromatic compounds are syringic acid, 4-hydroxybenzoic acid, and vanillic acid. And we have selected these aromatic compounds because they are lignin related products, specifically from poplar. And that's one of the major feedstocks we are working with in the lab. And also for this study, you will see that we are gonna work with two organisms, Tramitis versicolors and Gelatoporia supermispora. We selected these two because even the white of fungi break out the lignin, they don't do that uh, in a similar manner. For example, Tramitis versicolor is uh, able to degrade cellulose, I mean cellulose, lignin, all simultaneously, very efficiently. But Gelatoporia, differently, is gonna degrade the lignin preferentially, almost not touching cellulose and hemicellulose. Okay, so if you work in the bacterial world, you would say, oh, that's easy. If we wanna know if the fungi are utilizing aromatic compounds as a carbon source, and if they have these intracellular pathways, let's just grow the organisms and measure OD. Well, with fungi, it's, it's a bit more challenging. We have been trying a few times to just track growth uh, with aromatic compounds. And, and, and I can tell you that we don't have conclusive, conclusive data. Um, also, as I was saying, they are producing a lot of extracellular enzymes. So you could say, okay, let's just track uh, the aromatic compound over time. And if it decreases, it's being utilized. Not really because maybe those extracellular enzymes are modifying the aromatic compound and the, and the concentration is decreasing. Uh, then, well, genetic tools are underdeveloped. The gene annotation is still limited, but this is not, um, on, this is not only happening in water fungi. And the cultivation periods are long, not 360 millions of years, but few, few weeks. Okay, so let's go to the study. So the hypothesis of this study, as I was saying, was demonstrating the simultaneous depolymerization and utilization of lignin. So we were growing this fungi in, on poplar, like milk pro poplar or poplar chips. And here I'm gonna show you just a relevant data set from this study. Um, this is one organism, and here you have the degradation of the different polymers. Ooh, I don't know what that is. Uh, but this is lignin, this is cellulose, and this is semicellulose. And this is two different uh, time points in days, <laughs> not hours. So you can see that after 28 days, this organism is able to degrade 20% of the lignin, almost not utilizing uh, any cellulose and some, hemi some hemicellulose. And this is, yes, as you can see here, you have some water, some poplar, and your fungi. You don't need any other media. So perfect. We know that this fungi are degrading lignin. This is not new. But then we decided to track uh, soluble aromatic compounds in the cultivation. And here we have the control. And as I was saying, these are some of the aromatic compounds we find in poplar. This is 4-hydroxybenzoic acid, syringe, vanille. And then after the cultivation, we were also checking the concentration of those aromatic compounds. And this is the total conversion. Yes, focusing on this compound, the most abundant 100% had been utilized. But again, like we don't know if it's utilized or if it's being modified. So, it's like, okay, this is not conclusive. Uh, let's try to do, utilize a different approach. So uh, for this experiment, uh, we decided to utilize minimal media and we utilize cellobios as a carbon source to enhance the, the growth of the fungi, but we also utilize polydroxybenzoic acid and label and green, like carbon-13 green label. So the hypothesis is that if white of fungi are able to utilize this compound as a carbon source, uh, it should go to central metabolism, and then uh, the, from central metabolism, you are generating amino acids. So if it's a carbon source, we will see an increase in the carbon-13 labeling in this proteinogenic amino acid. So um, before we go to those data, well, these are the profiles about the utilization of the aromatic compound in the extracellular fraction. 
I'm not gonna go into details, but if we go inside the cell, here you have the proteinogenic amino acids. This is the fractional labeling. And here you have two time points for two different organisms. In gray, the control. In red, the label aromatic compound is very clear. You can see the, a significant increase in the labeling, which is already indicating that these fungi are utilizing aromatic compounds as carbon sources. So this was already like a big discovery for us is that they are doing it. But now is like, how are they doing that? Okay. This just goes a bit slow, it's not, it's not right? <laughs> okay, so now it's like, how are they doing that? <sighs> Sorry for the, <laughs> for the pace. So to elucidate the pathways for the utilization of these aromatic compounds towards central metabolism, we decided to utilize a systems biology approach. And we started with an in silico analysis. So for that purpose, we took aromatic catabolic pathways that have been described in other bacteria, in yeasts, even in some ascomycets, not in this type of fungi. And then we were doing homology searches uh, with, our, with the genome of our wider fungi. And here you have a series of those reactions. Here you have um, our molecule for hydroxybenzoic acid. And some of those enzymes that we find in some uh, yeast, actually we found them in this fungi. You can see that you have for hydroxybenzoic acid that can be subjected to different reactions. And the main reactions for the catabolism of aromatics are four, like very easy. Hydroxylation, oxidative decarboxylation, uh, ring cleavage, but dioxygenases or demethylation. But this is not the case for this compound. It would be for vanillate, that it has a metoxy group. So we are going to focus on these three reactions. So in red, uh, you can see those cases where they, we found some homology on enzyme sequence compared to previous uh, characterized enzymes. Basically, it goes from 4 hydroxybenzoic acid to protocalochue, uh, to benzene triol. This is intradiol ring cleft. So then the open ring can go to central metabolism, to beta ketoadipate, taxinase, acetic CoA, and TCA cycle. So this, is, this was our hypothetical pathway. OK, so with the enzymes that we found some homology for the two organisms, we built a phylogenetic tree for the oxidative decarboxylases, hydroxylases, or dioxygenases. And then we started our systems biology approach in vivo. OK, so we are going to focus on this compound. But basically, this is a very easy experimental approach. Your control, fungi plus cellobio. Your test, cellobio plus 4-HBA. So whichever are the enzymes, genes necessary for the metabolism of 4-HBA, we should see it through a systems biology approach. Uh, we are going to start with a metabolomics study. Uh, this was done at EMSO, and this was an NMR metabolomic approach, so very targeted uh, for the, um, our hypothesized pathway, but also for other molecules from other aromatic catabolic pathways. And here in black, you can see uh, some of the molecules we found uh, in the metabolomics study. So indeed, we had some hydroquinone that we had hypothesized, protocarechue, uh, extracellular, intracellular. So we were able to start mapping that out. So this uh, gave us some clues. But then it's like, okay, which are the enzymes involved in these processes? And here we are going to come back to our phylogenetic tree. This is like a very easy way to target enzymes that may be important for this process. Because uh, if we focus in this case, here we are seeing the proteomics data, transcriptomics data, and here you can see the differences in abundance compared to the control. So regarding the oxidative decarboxylases, you can see that here we have from the two organisms a clade that is being uh, upregulated, this gene, or we have three proteins that were more abundant. So this is telling us, hey, say this out. Maybe this oxidative decarboxylases may be involved in the modification of 4 hydroxybenzoic acid to hydroquinone, that's a decarboxylation, or from protocarechue to benzene triol. So 
all this data gave us a lot of hypotheses to further validate the function of the enzymes. And just like another fun fact from this data set, because there are so many questions you can ask to, to, to these data sets, but something that we found uh, very interesting is that uh, during the catabolism of 4-HBA, we also found in one organism that it, the compound was reduced. And this, was, this is unexpected. Normally, the compounds are oxidized. But we found 4-hydroxybenzaldehyde, 4 4-hydroxybenzyl alcohol. So we wanted to understand how that happened. And there is a family of enzymes called carboxylic acid reductases that basically they do this step from the acid to the aldehyde. And this is like, yeah, super cool because we found this compound, well, extracellularly in one fungi only, in tramites. And here you can see this is proteomics that only in this organism are found and are more abundant. So probably they are involved in the reduction of this aromatic compound. Yes, another a fun discovery. Um, okay. So, so basically what we have seen so far is we have hypothesized a pathway for the utilization of 4-hydroxybenzoic acid. But then we, we will so I will show you in the next slide how we are validating that. And this is just like uh, some work that we have ongoing in the lab. Uh, we are also working with vanillic acid because this reaction is also like very interesting, the, the, the methoxylation. So we are trying to understand how that happens. And also with a carbon-13 labeling approach, we have verified that these fungi are also able to utilize vanillic acid as a carbon source. And these are some, this is a lot of data, uh, but these are some metabolomic uh, studies, also NMR metabolomics from EMCEL. And just to say that we have found like a similar result than before. Uh, with tramites, we have also seen that vanillate is being reduced to vanillate and vanillin alcohol. So basically this information is telling us that even within white rofangia, the metabolism of aromatic compounds may be different. Okay, so we have our hypothetical pathway. Now we have to validate the different enzyme reactions. And for that purpose, we were working with JGI. And all those phylogenetical trees that I was showing there, uh, we sent all the sequences to JGI. And basically, and I can say like 100% of the sequences we sent, they were like, um, we got the plasmids for all of them. They were like produced, synthesized successfully. And it was 44. Uh, so then we were expressing this in E. coli, even though they were codon optimized for E. coli and PKPA stories. And for an initial screening of the different reactions, we were just talking the lysate of E. coli. And for the most promising um, cases, we started the purification of the enzyme. And this is what I'm going to be showing here. So oxidative decarboxylases, this step and this step, we were able to validate the function uh, via cofactor turnover assays. But we know that this can present some futile cycling. So apart from these assays, we have also verified the product. And this is ongoing work. We are gonna make crystals of these enzymes. They are extremely interesting. It seems that they work outside the cell, that they are membrane bound. So there is gonna be a, an story coming just about these two different steps. Then we have hydroxylases. And same thing, we were doing cofactor turnover assays. We validated a couple of them. And now we are also working, uh, uh, quantifying the product from both reactions and doing kinetics. And lastly, we have uh, a ring cleavage step that is done uh, via dioxygenases. And for that purpose, you just can track oxygen utilization. So they utilize oxygen to cleave the ring. And we have an oxygraph that is able to measure that. And we found that are specific for benzene triol, which was our uh, compound in our metabolic pathway. So uh, yeah, right now we have so many stories just related to these enzymes, yes, uh, to do crystallography with this one. And these ones we are doing kinetic assays and just like finding for which aromatic compounds they are active on. Okay, so I have yeah, a few more minutes. So as I was saying, the title of my presentation, Fungi versus Bacteria. So two slides. Um, as I was saying, ideally, it would be fantastic to have an organism 
that is able to degrade the lignin, depolymerize the lignin, utilize the monomers, and then convert it to a product and get rich. Uh, but now the question is like bacteria or fungi. So here is where the game comes. So, um, okay. Lignin depolymerization. Who thinks that fungi are better? Yes. Catabolism of aromatic compounds. Oh, wait. And this is not like bacteria in general. This is, I'm talking about aromatic catabolic bacteria. Like Pseudomonas putida, Rhodococcus STI. So who is better utilizing aromatic compounds? Fungi? We are just starting. We are just starting right now. It's just one aromatic compound. Like, there is so much to discover. And yeah, this is the opportunity. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I think it's going to come. Oh, sorry. <laughs> And I think it <laughs> okay. <laughs> Something that another opportunity for fungi. And then uh, lastly, um, I, this is not only about lignin, I think it's about wood. And I think that the white of fungi are just amazing degrading all the components simultaneously. So why not utilizing these organisms just to do it in one pot? So well, that would be amazing. But we need to develop genetic tools to make products. So that's the next step. Okay, conclusions. So um, the take home message, the the message is that we have demonstrated for the first time that carbon derived from lignin can be sequestered by white of fungi. And actually this is really important even for soil ecosystems by thinking that carbon from that polymer can be sequestered in the fungal biomass. And also, I think it's also clear that there is so much to learn from white of fungi. There are so many activities that we still need to discover, enzyme activities. And even apart from lignin or wood, like white of fungi can be utilized for many different applications. Maybe you have heard that now you can do leather, like different material, composites, textiles. Uh, it can be utilized for production of enzymes, degradation of plastics. So understanding the intracellular metabolism of white of fungi is not only important for biomass, but also for many other applications. And thank you so much to everybody that has been involved in this, in this study. Uh, well, first of all, I thank you to, to the Office of Science, BER, for the funding to conduct this work. Also, all the team at NREL, Carlos, Eric, Ateratas, Alexa, Alison, and, and Eugene. Also the M-cell team for proteomics, transcriptomics, NMR metabolomics, and JGI for DNA synthesis, and actually currently like some metabolomics work as well. And yeah, thank you so much. If you have any question, like for the people that are online, here you have my email. And this is a picture that someone thought that it was funny to take me pictures while I was taking pictures in Vancouver to the water of Anjai. So that's, that's my life. Thank you very much, Davinia. Uh, the interest of time, I can take only one question. I have one, one question, actually. So uh, I, I think you're looking also into the polymer degradation side, not only like the monomer degradation. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the, the you know, polymer degradation? That's a fantastic question. And this is, uh, we are currently working on that. We have demonstrated it with aromatic compounds, but now the idea is to track the carbon from the actual lignin, the polymer, to central metabolism. And this is work of one of the PhD students working with me. We haven't done that yet. That, that's the next step, like tracking the flux from the polymer to the TCA. That's, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Let's thanks again, Davinia.